What's up, my people? It is episode two of a Mental Awareness. I'm here with uh, Rafik Lockett now. He's no stranger to, to, to this. I think you are the feature of, of this uh, series, uh, Rafik. I'm good. I had a haircut and I gelled my hair just for today's episode because my daughter said, Daddy, you don't look cool. You look like an old topi. I said, OK, I'll do get a funky haircut. The fade, the fade is in as they sound the Cape Flats. The fade is. I'm, I'm scared to touch it. My fingers might get stuck in there. Uh, uh, wicked. Now we, we the first episode, uh, Rafik, we touched on what is anxiety, with the five different types of anxiety. And for those watching now, if you if you never followed, if you never seen the first one, go check that one out and then come watch episode two because it is a continuation. Well, not continuation. But we are dealing with today, we're dealing with signs, uh, signs and um, symptoms of anxiety. Now, uh, Rafik, how do I know I have anxiety? Okay, so last week we spoke about that the one-off is nothing. Yeah, well, you know, if it, all of us have a bad night, a bad day, we have an argument, we have a fight or whatever, and then it passes in a day or two. Right. Anxiety, you just feel consistently like something's not right. Okay, so there's this feeling of dread, this feeling of worry all the time. And, and then the last time we spoke about how there, there's normal anxiety, and then it, it kind of flows over into problematic anxiety. Okay, so just to make the point again from last week, a certain amount of anxiety and worry is normal. You do something wrong, and then your boss calls you in. You can't be all like, "Hey, how's it? What's happening?" You're gonna before that, your stomach will be in, not. You're gonna get disciplined, whatever it is. Okay, so that that's not anxiety. That's normal anxiety. Okay, where we're talking about how do you now have anxiety that's not normal is excess and continuous. Okay, so people who have anxiety are continuously on the edge. They're expecting bad things to happen. Um, like their friends say to them all the time, dude, you're always so tense, like, like chill, relax, man. And then they say things like, I, I'm trying, but I just can't. Okay, so that's how you know it's not a bad day or like a bad couple of days. It's 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 been there consistent. And and often people will say, you know what, I've always had this. It's been like this since youngs or whatever. Okay, so to answer your simple question is when it's continuous, when it's consistent, when you can't shake it, Okay. And it's not one off. So I think make the point we all have bad days, we all have off days, me, you, everybody. But but in a day or two, we're back to okay again. Anxiety, when you have anxiety, you can't shake it. It's there all the time. And your friends and family will tell you that. And you know, they'll talk about your like your tentness, you jumpy, everything freaks you out a little bit, and you just you're just anxious all the time. Okay, so that, yeah. that's really what it is. I, I must say, um, actually, I, I, I've done a uh, um, analysis of myself this past weekend. So I was emceeing a, a big event and I was out there and I just started feeling anxious and I had to do a reality check. I was like, Dev, is this anxiety kicking in or are you just nervous because you're about to go onto a stage of possibly a thousand people? And I'm like, no, Devin, this is just normal. Uh, you're just feeling anxious because of the situation that you're in. So it, it was temporary. It was literally like, like, you know, you get the jitters like uh, about a minute before going on with any situation, whether you're going to a hospital, whether you do, you're performing or, or you're public speaking or, you know, at work, that, that's a normal anxiety um, that I've experienced of late. And I have to really literally tell myself, Dev, this is uh, not anxiety as you you know, before, uh, Rafik, this is anxiety. Um, that that's the normal anxiety when you when you are in a, a <clears throat> excuse me when you are in a situation. Um, yeah, so it's situation how, appropriate. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, for taking, <laughs> thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Now, how do we know the difference between anxiety and normal stress or nerves? Like, how do we know this is? Um, this is serious or not? Okay. So, so again, follow, following up from, from last week, okay, so we, we spoke about this, like, like you just said, situation appropriate. Okay, so you're giving a talk, you're going for the job interview. Right. 
So when it starts to become a problem is where outside the job interview, you start to panic. You start to sweat, you start, right? And, and then you can't, you can't get the words out because now your brain has slipped into what we call limbic system arousal. Or we've activated the brain's emergency system. So it's when it becomes problematic. So remember that, that nerves you had just before going on stage, that's actually appropriate because A, you need a kickstart. Right? If you're too chilled, then you, like you're too laid back, like you don't take the situation seriously. I said to you last week, I, I was nervous about the show to start. But if I if I'd called you and said, Devin, I'm canceling, sorry, man. You know, this, this is too much, I, I can't do it. Okay, so now normal anxiety became problematic anxiety because it's caused me to stop doing something. Okay, so if you had then said to yourself, I can't go on stage, there's a thousand people, I can't do this, I can't even get the words out of my, I can't get my brain to think about what I'm going to say, then that's not normal anymore. But it's become a problem. Mm. So when anxiety causes distress in your life, Okay, to the point where, where you're stopping doing things or you can't do things or, you, or you're refusing to attend things because of your anxiety or, or your panic, then it's having a direct impact on your life. Mm. Social life, work life, sports life, sex life, all of that put together, when it has an impact negatively, then you have to say, okay, wait, 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 wait. You know, so having a muscular pain is okay. But, but if it's mm. a point where you... Like you can't get up and you can't walk anymore on that leg, and then at, at, at that point, that little muscular pain has become a problem because now you can't walk. Okay, so then you need to get help and say, what's wrong with my leg? Then they figure out what, you know, when you tore a ligament or whatever it is. I mean, you, you had that, right, on your knee. I, w I was just going to say now, I was in hospital two weeks ago for an operation, and I've never been in hospital before, and that was part of my anxiety. Um, of course. You know, being in hospital, that was, I was very anxious. And I was, while I was laying in the bed, before they wheeled me into theater, the lady, the nurse took my, uh, took my blood pressure. She, she took every, all those, all those different types of readings. And um, she asked me, she looked at my blood pressure. She's like, hey, dude, your, your blood pressure is way too high. And well, it's, well, it was high. And then I said, I'm feeling anxious. And then she said, that's normal. Everybody comes in there feeling anxious. If you never felt anxious in that situation, then they must be worried. Yeah, then you're not understanding the situation well. <laughs> exactly. So uh, uh, it's, uh, obviously, like you said, it's all with regards to the, um, the event that's taking place. Uh, so I hear you on that. What, what are the what are but what are the common triggers for anxiety? Like I know this caffeine. People spoke of caffeine, um, energy drinks. What 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 causes your brain? What what triggers? Okay, so the, the last time we we spoke about the psychological conditions and what we didn't talk about, which we're saving for the next episode when we have the the psychiatrist with us, and and then we talk about hormonal causes. Okay. okay, we'll talk about medication causes, talk about drug drug causes, and uh, um, we'll talk about things like, like hyperthyroidism. Okay, so those are all things that can generate the feeling of anxiety. Mm. Okay, so now we're separating anxiety into psychological causes, psychological anxiety. Okay, then the feeling of anxiety brought on by excess caffeine or Red Bull. Or I mean, I have some, some friends, you know, they, they drink one cup of coffee and then they start to do this. And I'm like, what's wrong? I say, hey, no, that coffee is giving me the stomach, but never have it on the empty stomach again. But just because it's, it's uh, the caffeine rush feels uncomfortable. Okay, now, not everybody gets that, but I'm just saying some people get that. Some people, certain medications, the side effect of that, one of the side effects is a feeling of anxiety and, and certainly hormonal stuff, right? But that's not really my field. So that person who was an expert in that will talk about that uh, to explain how to recognize when the feeling of anxiety is now caused by either an internal chemical condition, hormonal, or some substance that you're taking, either legal or illegal, or some, some, some kind of like energy drink that has excess caffeine. Yeah. So, so if, that, that can cause that can cause if, the same feeling. If you could, and I'm putting you on the spot here, if you could, is there any things that we consume daily um, that 
that could trigger like caffeine or energy drinks? Is there any, any other things that you can think of? So look, I, I can only share the things that people have come to me with. Okay. Yeah, you know, so because remember now, human bodies are different. Everybody reacts differently. Some people can have eight cups of coffee, no hassle. Somebody can have one. I have a friend who takes a Red Bull and he falls asleep. And I'm like, dude, how is that even possible? Okay, because when I was younger and I was, you know, like staying awake to study and stuff, you know, like you hit the coffee, you hit the Red Bull. Truck drivers take Red Bull a lot, but excessive. And he just take Red Bull and he's asleep in five minutes. Okay, so the point is, everybody reacts differently. So, I mean, there, there are general things that the research talks about, excessive coffee, so six, eight cups a day, right? That that can generally cause stuff to do. Uh, like I said, medication again. Uh, we will talk about weed in the next episode because that, that has like different reactions to different people. I have had patients come in and say, look, I did weed the weekend and I had been having massive panic attacks since then. Can't get a grip on it. What's going on with me? So it's it's really very really individualized response. Okay, so different people react differently to certain things. Sugar. You give some light is excess sugar, and then they're like the air you let out of a balloon. You know, yeah, all, all over the place. And that that's I think most most parents will say. You know, if I, if I give my kid chocolates or too much sweets, he's all over the place. Uh, that, that, okay, so that, that, was exact, that was exactly me. You know, I when I uh, figured I had anxiety. I was like, hey, I'm anxious, blah, blah, blah. But then I also tried to resort to comfort food and it was chocolate. And then people said, you can't have chocolate and uh, because that increases, you know, there's a trigger and I had to stay away from coffee. I had to stay away from chocolate. I had to stay from away from energy drinks. I mean, I worked with a brand, the energy the brand, and I had about two cases here of those energy drinks that I couldn't touch it because... <laughs> Um, you know, obviously I was scared it's going to fuel my anxiety. Um, one of the things that I've, ex well, not one of the things, one of the major things I think every person that goes through anxiety feels is the physical symptoms, the weird symptoms that, that we go through. And I yeah. just want to share with you um, and the viewers watching, uh, uh, you know, um, I had a heart palpitations. I had my I had brain fog. I had my the worst part was my body trembling, my bones trembling, uh, my legs feeling weak. Um, I also felt nauseous, like constant no like I only I I literally could only sleep or lay down, put my head down on the bed, and that's when I'd feel much better. I've had chest pains, I've had every single thing. And how, how, does, how does anxiety play a role and, and, and showcasing or bringing to light these pains and activating? How do you connect the two? Okay, so, so ev everything that, that you've now said right, is part of the recognized physical symptoms of anxiety. So we spoke about psychological symptoms last week, which is fear, worry, dread. Right. But then, they, because anxiety is also in the body, so... Again, normal anxiety, the feeling's there for a little while and then it's gone. Okay, uh, it's called pathological anxiety. Your body has to deal with this now on a daily basis. Okay, so here, here's a small example, right? Uh, the guys that race cars at Indiana and all this stuff, okay? So, I mean, many, many years ago, I also did stuff like that. Right? And, for those that sorry, for those that don't know Indiana, it's golden dish back in the day. I don't know if they still do it. I'm out of that many years now. But when I was younger, I also you know, did racing on the M5 and stuff. But okay. Now, the, the thing is that the olden cars, okay, you didn't have fuel injectors. You had like basic in carburetors and, and they didn't have rev limiters. Okay? So you could rev the car. Into, now, these days, you can't over rev a car because the electronic thing kicks in okay, to stop you from wrecking the engine. But yeah. the older cars didn't have that. Okay, And every car, is designed to be driven into the red line to overtake and come out, okay? overtake and come out. So third gear, overtake, come out. But if you leave the engine in the red line, no car engine was designed to stay in the red line for a period of time. So things start to go wrong. Small things happen. The car is like over for too long, okay, but the 
the exhaust gets loose, something goes wrong, something goes wrong. Small things start to go wrong because the thing is over revving for too long and people don't focus because they're busy racing. And they go, third, third, fourth. Blah. And the next something goes, bah, a gasket is gone. Okay. So the engine was not designed to be driven in the red line for a sustained period of time. Okay, our bodies are not designed to remain anxious for a continuous period. So we can get anxious for like a situation, then our bodies make me, after the situation's done, okay, we normalize. But of course, if you have anxiety, the situation doesn't normalize. It, it kind of remains in the red zone. Which means now that okay, your body is producing excess adrenaline, excess cortisol, and all of that was not how our body was organized. So then things start to go wrong inside. Things start to go wrong, right? And then that like, you get all these symptoms that, that you were talking about. So it's as a result of the excessive chemicals that are produced, as a result of, let's say, anxiety overdrive. You're over revving your in. So if you were a car, and you have serious anxiety, your, your engine's basically over revving every day, right? And sometimes it doesn't even switch off at night. Okay, so there's no there's no real rest for your body. It's, it's, it's constantly revving. And when it's constantly revving, your body has to find ways to help you cope. And all of that means it has to then give you all these extra chemicals, which are designed to help you cope in the short term. Adrenaline is an important hormone. That's right? so our fight or flight. We spoke about it last session. So, but it's meant to pump into your body. You either run or you fight, and then it's done. Right? Everything reboots. With anxiety, there's no rebooting. Okay, so it's just like the engine starts to blow gaskets, okay, we start to have things go wrong in our bodies. And, and you mentioned a lot of symptoms. Uh, so often people end up at the ER of a hospital because they think they're having a heart attack. That's the first thing. <laughs> that is me. I think that it me. must be checked because it could be a heart attack. So we also don't want to label it, ah, just anxiety, don't worry, then poof, the old dies of a heart attack right there. Okay, so we don't do that. So it's the right thing to go and have it checked out because the first thing that happened was, so when you're in a panic state, your brain sends a message to your heart to say, listen, pump like hell. So the heart mm -hmm. suddenly starts pumping and then your adrenal glands kick in and then that gives the energy. But then there's nothing happening for you to do that. If you have a gun to your head and you get those feelings, you know why you feel this way, okay? So you don't think, what's wrong with me? You think, shit, this is bad, right? And, and then you feel that stuff. With anxiety, and it's not situational, you get all those feelings okay, with, with nothing that you can pin it on. Yeah. And then now your heart is pumping. So if, if, if your heart pumps, all of us go, and then people are going to go, Listen, dude, like you're getting red, you're sweating. What's happening? You're rushed to the hospital. Then they put you on the ECG and they say, no, it's cool. It's just a panic attack. And people hate it when they say, ah, it's just a panic attack because it feels terrible. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not just a, just a panic attack. Uh, there's a wonderful movie that you may have seen called Analyze This. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. Robert yeah. De Niro is a, is a mafia don. And he starts getting panic attacks. So there's a scene where he, he goes to the ER and the doctor says, oh, don't worry about it, man. It's just a panic attack. And then he says, do I look like a guy who panics? Do I look like a guy who panics? And then they <laughs> donate him in the ER, okay? Because how, how dare you tell the mafia boss that, that you've got panic attacks. Mm -hmm. but, but he was having it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't feel that he should have because, you know, he's like the mafia boss. But it's a completely normal thing to get. I, I was in the I was in the um, my first ever anxiety more panic attack. Um, I was um, laying in bed on a Friday night during COVID, laying in bed doing absolutely nothing, laying on my phone. Uh, I was alone at home, and I just felt my heart uh, beat uh, heart. I felt heart palpitations, and I was like, "This is not normal. This is not right." I had a sports watch on. I could see my heart rate, and it was. It was jumping all over the place. And I was like, like David, 160, 150 around there. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, why? Why is it going from 90 to 140? And it's literally within seconds. And I'm laying in bed and I couldn't make sense of this. Then long story short, I, I never slept the whole night. I thought I was, I got to a point that I was like, you know what, Lord, if this is your time to take me now, if this is a heart attack, 
take me now. I'm ready to go. I've made my peace now because this is throughout the night that I've been feeling this heart palpitations. Uh, in anyways, I ended up at the uh, the doctor's office. I had an ECG mis, uh, uh, ECG uh, test. Doctor didn't pick up anything. He's like, hey, this could be you know um, anxiety, but he can't he can't uh, talk about it. Then um, when was it? There was another instance. Yes, uh, I ended up. So I've never been into hospitals, number one, for all my life. I've never stayed at hospitals, never visited. If I got sick, I'd take a med lemon and ginger beer. That's what my mom believed. <laughs> my mom believed that was a cure. So I never, in, I never went to hospitals, really. And um, long story short, during my, my, my experience with anxiety, I ended up quite a few times in hospital. It got to a point where I felt there was a pain in my uh, left testicle. I was like, this is not right. I, I couldn't, it was weird. It wasn't right. And I had it for a couple of months and I just built up the courage. I thought, hey, you know what? Obviously, your brain is going to tell you the worst case scenario. It's going to say, you know what, Devin, this is cancer. Go check it out. And eventually got the courage to go, checked it out at the hospital. And um, they done the sonar, they done everything, and they never picked up anything. But you know, the crazy thing is, that when I walked out of that doctor's office, that pain was in, like gone forever. I never, I never, I never experienced that pain after going to the doctor, getting them to say, Dev, there's no cancer. They, the pain disappeared. And then I realized it is a mental, mental thing. It is a proper mental thing. Um, um, as well as, I mean, the, the symptoms are there. You feel the pain, even with your, your blood pressure, it skyrockets. Your heart racing, you know, it's it's it, the symptoms are there, but it doesn't mean you are having a heart attack or you do have cancer. Um, uh, back then, when I had anxiety, I'd sleep, and during the night, I'd literally just, um, as I say, skrk awake. Um, how does anxiety and sleep work together? Okay, so just 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 before that, I'll, I'll make this point. So we're not saying that every symptom you get is, is psychological. So it is important to go to the doctor and say, I'm having these symptoms. Check me out first, please. Um, right? And then the doctor or the ER it will say to you, okay, listen, we've done the test. It's okay, right? It's not a heart attack or it's not whatever happening. Uh, okay, it's psychological. So, so, so important for all the people who are watching your show okay, to understand that you must get it checked we don't immediately label it psychological because it could actually be a heart attack because the symptoms are so similar. So go and check it out. Right? The GP will tell you, the hospital will tell you, listen, it's okay, it's fine. Now, some people still don't accept the explanation and then they go and have another one then they have a third checkup and a fourth checkup. But at that point, if you've been to five different doctors and, and they're saying to you, listen, it's anxiety. Okay, but you still firmly believe that there's something wrong inside your body, then you need to get help because now you've had five specialists say to you, listen, everything is fine. They, they, there's no condition, but you still think, nope, nope, they're missing something, that they're missing something. But you know, after like going to four or five people who are all experts and they all say to you, listen, we've checked every possible thing. There's nothing wrong with you, but, but you can't shake that. Okay, then you've gone, now you've slipped into an anxiety state and then that's when you need help to change that kind of things. So in your case, the moment the doctor reassured you, that part of your brain that was generating the worry about this is cancer, it went to sleep. Yeah. And then like the symptoms diminished because the system wasn't in overdrive anymore. Right, that's sleep. So sleep is one of the first things that gets disturbed when you have anxiety. Remember I said earlier on, okay, your brain doesn't switch off, so you are over revving the car. And there are, there are the different parts of the brain, and, and maybe like in the other episode, we'll, we'll talk about the different parts of the brain. Uh, so there's your prefrontal cortex here, which is your thinking brain. That never stops. So even when you, even when you go to sleep at night, okay, that, that part of the brain, whatever was making you feel that, that still activates. So people even get panic attacks in their sleep. Okay? It's a common thing. And they that they wake up in like a panic state. Now, sometimes it's caused by nightmares. And unfortunately, your brain can't tell the difference between real and virtual. Okay, yeah. So if you go to sleep and you have a nightmare that like you're being chased on Table Mountain by the six-legged monster, 
Okay, your brain actually believes that. And so your body then believes whatever your brain tells it to. Mm. And so, like your brain goes, ah, monster. It's all in the dream. And then your body goes, right, absolutely. And then, so now you must pump adrenaline, it's emergency system, you must run away from this thing. So all that system gets activated in your sleep. And then you wake up and then you're sweating and your heart is beating and you think, what the hell is going on? And you're like, ah, oh, it was just a dream. Right. I mean, a like, silly example, but, but uh, uh, like youngsters who have wet dreams, I mean, that, that's even more crazy. Okay. You, you dream, you're having sex. And then your body responds physically to that. You get an erection, you get an ejaculation, and then you wake up and then, oh, you're all alone in the bed and you feel terrible because where's the person who's supposed to be there? But it's another example of how your brain can't tell the difference between real and virtual. Okay, so if you imagine something, okay, your body believes it. And that's yeah. where BWRT therapy comes in that we talk about. So we actually use that natural system in your brain. So just remember that if your brain believes it, if your brain sees it, your body believes it. <laughs> that's, that's deep there. If, there your brain, exactly. if your brain, if your brain, brain sees it, your body believes it. That's a hashtag. Okay, so he, hence, hence your, your physical reaction to a nightmare. Okay, you, there should be a system where your brain knows that you, you're going to bed, you're in your bed, but it, mm. it doesn't. In the dream, you know, you're on the mountain, you are falling off, the people are chasing you, the monster is about to eat you, and then you wake up. And at that point, your body is in a completely aroused place. Some people wake up drenched in sweat, their heart is pumping, they're like, what? And then, and then they're so relieved because they're in their room and it's just a dream. But that's a good example of how your brain can't tell the difference. And your body can't tell the difference. Because there should be a filter that says, listen, do it like you're sleeping there. It's okay, you're not on the mountain. There's no monster here. But there isn't such a system. Okay, yeah. if you dream it, okay, okay your body will, will react to it. We um we uh, I've, 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 you know obviously we as humans we jump on uh, on the on Google and we we find ways to deal. And I think before I met you, one of the tips someone said to me, "Hey, Devin, you need to trick your brain, um, not when you're sleeping, but during the day when you have anxiety. Take a chewing gum, eat something." Um, chew on something because it's basically telling your brain that you are not in panic mode. You are not. So you got to kind of trick your brain like during the day. But I mean, we don't have that during the night. I mean, we're sleeping. Our minds are supposed to be at ease. So there's no tricks unless it's medication that we can take, you know? Um, okay. okay. So then, then we, we slip into unhealthy coping. So now people know that they're not going to sleep tonight. Okay. They rest. So then they start taking sleeping pills. Okay. So then the doctor prescribes a certain amount and then they double dose. Or people start to take excessive alcohol just to help them sleep, or they start to take other drugs to help them sleep. Uh, okay, so that, that's when we get into unhealthy coping. But 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 one understand people are just desperate to sleep, you know, and, and and they know that they can have like another bad night, which means of course you wake up tired, which means you wake up in a bad mood, which means that your brain's not functioning optimally, which means the chances of making mistakes at work become high, with mean, the chance of, of then uh, like getting into trouble at work mm -hmm. then of course if you don't sleep well you're irritable which right plus now you add that onto the anxiety you already have which means you're like a trigger with a very short fuse you know you trip mm -hmm. on people easily and obviously like your very good friends will understand but but not everybody will people say what's wrong with this person like they're overreacting yeah. to everything like come on chill dude and the people who are anxious hate being told to chill yeah <laughs> because if they could chill they will that's the thing, right? If they could chill, they will. It's almost like people saying, you got control over this. Actually, no, you don't have control. You, you can learn control. Yeah. Right? But I, well, people often say to me, you know, I hate it when someone says, hey, bro, chill, man. Why, why are you stressing so much? So mm -hmm. the thing is that that's an unfair judgment because one doesn't know what the person is experiencing. One doesn't know that this is their third night without sleep. And they got dark rings under that. They're basically crawling mm -hmm. around. And uh, then it becomes, unfortunately, then it just becomes like a downhill slide from there. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do drastic things like take excessive sleeping pills or do all kinds of unhealthy coping just to get sleep. 
And sometimes those pills you wake up five times more groggy. So the sleep wasn't a good quality sleep. And uh, yeah, so, so the anxiety definitely affects sleep just because of the arousal. Wow. Just while, while we're on sleep, okay, pe people do like really unhelpful things. Okay, so remember, if you're on a screen, a screen has got bright light, right? There's a, I don't know how many million pixels there. Now, okay, you watch, you're watching the screen before bedtime. Who puts bright lights on before they go to sleep? Oh. Right, we, we normally close the curtain because we want darkness because our, our brain then goes, ah, okay, this is nighttime. So then it sets up the mechanism to sleep, right? Mm. But now okay, you're busy on your screen, checking messages, watching stuff, bright lights in your brain. Then a part of your brain is going, but what was nighttime? Okay, well, maybe I got it wrong, right? And so. It activates. Then, even worse, we watch action movies before we go to bed. Now, what happens in an action movie? We get excited. Things are happening. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh. Yeah. Now, think about this, okay? You're activating all your arousal systems 10 minutes before you expect to fall asleep peacefully. So you have kids, right? Who reads an action-packed story to their child before bedtime? True. Which response? Was, no one reads. And then the, ah, and the bomb exploded and the and Cinderella came and they whisked her away. Kids wide awake. He's not going to sleep. Yeah. But we only read like soothing, calm stories. We drop our voice. We put the lights so we, we sing gentle lullabies. And maybe the kid falls asleep. In my case, I used to fall asleep before my child. I would put myself to sleep accidentally. But the thing is that these are little things that people don't understand. You can't activate your brain before bedtime and then say, I don't know why, I don't know why I can't, my brain won't stop. So yeah. if you pump adrenaline into your body before bedtime, it's going to keep you awake. So it's a small, simple thing. It's just like stop using your screen about two hours before bedtime. Rather read a book because there's no lot, flashing lights. And lot absolutely people... don't watch action movies just before bedtime. A lot of people use that as coping mechanisms, but they don't understand that uh, these are triggers and it activates your brain to, you know, you, you're in that adrenaline mode of, of, of the yeah. brain. Activating if you've got that. a sports watch on, I mean, I don't have one, but if, if, you, if you watch an action movie, just watch your heart rate during exciting periods in the movie. When there's wow. something bad about to happen or an explosion or a car chase, check your heart rate automatically shoots up because your brain is reacting to what it sees, an explosion or panic or whatever. Then you're like, okay, movie done. Okay, I'm going to go sleep now. Then you lay there. Like, I don't know why I'm not sleeping. I don't understand. Okay, so if people are watching, very small, simple tip. Don't, don't look at your screen and certainly don't watch hectic action movies or horror movies before bedtime. I'm, I'm a victim of that. I found that I needed to watch or be on my phone in order to fall asleep because my mind was busy. But it's something that um, I had to learn and practice and put my phone down and say, you know what, now it's bedtime. Now I need to say, say good night. Um, so that, that's what... People you know, must just think about, would you do that to a child that you want to put to sleep? Think so, about the same thing you do to a child. You wouldn't stimulate a child, throw him in the air, wrestle with him. It's okay, like bedtime now, you must sleep. Child's going to lay there like, no, I can't sleep now. I'm all activated. And one major thing, oh, it, is, um, it is suicide. So in general, people who have anxiety don't attempt suicide. Okay. Because the thought of killing themselves generates too much panic. Okay. So that, that's one of the good things we know is that people who have anxiety it's very rare for them to kill themselves. People who attempt suicide are those who are depressed. And maybe that, that should be like a topic for like another day, depression. So in, 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 in general, people who have anxiety don't kill themselves. They don't attempt suicide uh, because that, that thought frightens them so much that they can't do it. So in a very bizarre way, having anxiety is like a protection against suicide. I, what what I found what I found with myself because I also had suicidal thoughts, um, but I was dealing with anxiety. I, well, my thoughts was a, 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 a ripple effect because I've I was I was 
nauseous i was my my legs were weak i thought is this my life i can't do this um so i i'm not saying that i that i was going to commit suicide but i was that thought came into my mind is, is that so there, yeah so there, there's a difference between what we technically call suicidal ideation meaning the thought suicidal intent which is the intention to do it Okay, so, so everybody at some point when there's like a lot going on, like, like in your case, you just think, you know, I wish I'd just die and end this thing. But, but you wouldn't actually go and jump off a building. You wouldn't actually take a knife and cut your throat. Either, because that thought alone will freak you out totally. So suicidal ideation generally comes from frustration, right? Where you, where you, that, that you kind of feel, feel like stuck. And then you just get the thought. But the actual doing it, so we're talking about those who actually attempt versus those who just have a thought. So, of course, ideation, we do take it seriously. But generally, people who just have a thought every now and again don't actually do it. And so, in general, there's always exception. And, you know, we talk about human beings. We're obviously generalizing a lot because we've been talking broadly. But people are unique and they react in different But in general, People who have excess anxiety don't try to kill themselves. They may have a thought about it, but they won't actually do it because that thought generates so much panic and fear that they can't do it. To suicide, we're talking about people who have clinical depression generally, where they've lost all hope and they feel hopeless and helpless for a persistent period of time. Right, And maybe at some other point, we, uh, we can talk about impulsive suicide attempts versus planned suicide attempts. That, that well, may be like a whole discussion itself. Just, 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 uh, I know I'm maybe drifting here, but in terms of suicide and, um, well, not anxiety, but suicide in general, um, how are we looking as a country? I know obviously with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's right. So the last stats I saw, uh, we had the third highest suicide rate in Africa. Wow. I, I can't remember, uh, which were the top two countries, but in 2019, I think it was, the stats came out that about 14,000 people had killed themselves in South Africa, okay, suicide. Um, but interestingly enough, there's been a 2.5% decline in the suicide rate. So suicide rate means people who actually kill themselves. Okay, we're not, we're not counting those who make an attempt and then get saved by, by, the, by the hospital or the family members catch them on time. The actual completed suicide is about 14,000 in 2019. I don't have the latest stats, but I know that at that time we spoke about college because we, we were the third highest in Africa. Uh, worldwide terms, we are high, but we're certainly not the highest. And I think that the decline in suicide rate has happened because there's far more interventions available now. You know, so like an initiative like this, and there are many other interventions going on. Schools are doing interventions now. There's interventions everywhere. So it's a 2.5% drop in the suicide rate might not seem like a lot, but it is a lot. It means 2.5% of those who were going to kill themselves didn't. Mm. Um, so, so the stats are improving in terms of preventing suicide, I think entirely because of programs like this, where, where, where there's, you know, there's much more intervention, much more awareness now. Uh, so in schools, in clinics, in shows like this, on like on soapies, you know, they talk about things like it's it's mm. it's out there, like it's not hidden anymore. Yeah. So so people then know that they can get help, and so they go and get help. So that that's why there's been certainly been uh, a drop in reported actual suicides. That's very good. That that's that's welcoming to you. You know, um, I recently I got a phone call. Well, I say a phone call, a message, um, a random person, somebody I don't really know, uh, message, a hey, dude, somebody I know that is committing, wanting to commit suicide. Me never ever being in that in, situ in that situation before, um, I found myself, and I think why this person reached out was because I spoke or I speak about mental health often on my platform. So I think this was them reaching out and saying, Hey man, uh, somebody I know it's, it's uh, suicidal. What can I do? Me not having an understanding of what to do, um, 
immediately I went on to Google. I, had, I found a number, suicide hotline. And I was like, um, I called the number and I called them and I said, look, this is the situation I'm in. What do I do? They asked me if, if I know the person personally. I said, no, this is through a friend. And they obviously advised me so that, so what I'm trying to say here is that access, there's information that is accessible um, now compared to a few years ago where people didn't know Google, they never had access, they used the yellow pages. Um, so uh, it's encouraging to hear like platforms like this, that we're having this, this, um, this, this event here with mental awareness. Um, and other forms of just educating people and saying, hey, you know what, it's not okay to be okay. Your yeah, ease therapy, you can overcome this. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that, that's a definite fact. So certainly platforms like this have made a difference because the stats show it. Not that our stress levels have gone. In fact, I think South Africa's stress levels have gone up, but the suicide rates come down a little bit. And that, that's a good thing. And I, I have to think it's because of interventions like this. Yeah. No, thank you. It's good, good to know. Uh, but we are just trying to do our best and, and, and showcase and let people know that it's okay to not be okay. Uh, uh, Rafik, levels of anxiety, light to intense, is there, like, do you experience it obviously different to what I experience, anxiety? Yeah, so, I mean, there are, there, there's difference of intensity, you know, uh, so it's like volume on your radio or your speaker, and you can have like a day and turn it louder, 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 louder. That can happen. So people certainly. So when we cross that line from normal anxiety into let's call it now pathological anxiety, you can get different levels of that. The most extreme form, obviously, would be a panic attack. So like a, at that point, your body is in, in full emergency zone. Everything's activated, but you can have that that mild worry, like I said, that's continuous, it is it's kind of like a like a helicopter that's hovering every day, you know, like you, you hear the sound, after a while you kind of get used to the helicopter sound if it's there every day, but it's there. And only when it's not there, do you realize how loud the helicopter sound, sound was. So there can be mild anxiety, moderate anxiety, different levels of volume, let's call it that way. Uh, but the loudest volume being a panic attack. Oh, that 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 must that that that's a. I actually didn't. I thought there was, um, you know, something after a panic attack. I thought there was, but like you said, you know, in, in terms of intensity, you know, you know, you've you've reached the top tier of anxiety is when you experience a panic attack. Um, one of the last questions even I have. Panic have, attacks, you, you know, that you get moderate and then you get severe panic attacks. So, so it's even there, there's varying degrees. But all of them have like the one thing in common is that they belong to anxiety. But it's just some people have it worse, others have it less. Can I ask, is there, have you ever experienced any weird symptoms? Some symptoms that that's not the norm of anxiety? Yeah, so, so the common one, like I said to you, is that worry, fear, right, and anxiety. But there are so many. In fact, in fact, the one thing people shouldn't do is maybe Google up symptoms of anxiety uh, because there'll be so many things pop up. And then people in an anxious state then actually start to then develop those symptoms because, because like it says, you should. But there, there are things. So we spoke about, you know, like the heart palpitations, the obvious one, the dizziness. And that's because if the blood is rushing away, then you obviously get dizzy. Uh, there is a breathlessness obviously connected to like your heart. So all the things you had, right? Yeah. Those are the normal symptoms, but it can get it, it, it can get weird. You can get like pins and needles, you can get diarrhea. Okay. So it's so often young kids and when the other psychologists who like talk to you like about children, often children have stomach complaints when they're being bullied at school or they don't want to go, they're anxious for the test. Little kids often say that, that, that their stomach is sore. And their parents say, oh, can your stomach is sore? But that's an anxiety symptom. So you're going to have all of the things, like you're going to have skin rashes as a result of anxiety. You can have diarrhea and constipation. Not at the same time, obviously. You can either have diarrhea or you can have constipation. Uh, you can have numbness. You can have pins and needles. Okay? You can have fainting spells. And obviously, we know that concentration gets affected. So people who have excess anxiety can't focus and concentrate because their brain has been used for other things. 
And uh, one, once anxiety kicks in, it affects your prefrontal cortexes, which is your logical brain. And last time we spoke about exam anxiety, how that, you know, you're anxious, then one thing tricks you, trip into an emergency zone, and then your brain can't access all the info you spend hours learning. And later on, when the system reboots, you're like, oh man, I knew all that stuff. I knew all those things. Why couldn't I access it? Just because you went into panic mode. And unfortunately, your brain is designed at that point for your logic brain to switch off and your emergency brain to switch on. And your emergency brain is basic fight or flight. Okay, so you can't think logically in fight or flight. Um, okay, so there's a range of symptoms, but please, as a belief, don't go and Google up which symptoms do I not have yet. Yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> because then you'll generate that symptom. It's just how the brain works. And you, know, you think, and then you'll start imagining the symptom. And then suddenly you'll start believe the symptom is there. Yeah. Now I I, I want to share something with you that I found online. Um, so I follow this lady on Instagram, very, very honest about her anxiety journey. Um, and uh, this is how I come to, before uh, meeting you and knowing of you, um, I literally saw her Instagram uh, social media. She's out in America. It's holistically holistic. That's a, that, um, a IG handle. And she said the symptoms that terrified me before I before it was anxiety. This is what she wrote. She wrote a few. I'm going to run through it quickly. She said yep. random intense pain anywhere in the head or body. Uh, yep. Feeling strange, panicky, and lightheaded under fluorescent lights. Random scary thoughts that would pop into your head like you're not going to make it home today. Feeling yeah. scared to fall asleep, thinking yeah. I wouldn't wake up. A heart racing 24-7 and weird flutters and skips. Muscle pain and twitching. That's me. I had that throughout my body. My eyes would uh, twitch. Uh, my, my muscles in my body would twitch. Um, constantly feeling off balance and blurry vision. I've had that. My legs felt weak, often a constant knot in my stomach and feeling that something terrible was going to happen, but, it did, but I did not know what. Then there was this weird whoosh feeling through my head, constant extreme fatigue. I had that. I think I still, <laughs> I'm always tired. I think we all are. We all are. Um, and then she goes on to say, um, constantly yawning. And I've, I've experienced, uh, I experienced that in the car during the day at 11 o'clock in the morning, I found myself yawning. And um, I relate to this. I know you said we shouldn't Google because that activates things. And we start, you know, waiting for it to happen and sends messages to our brain and expect that to happen type of thing. But these are the things that I also I relate to and I experience with anxiety. So I, and and I agree with you. We all experience it different. You know, some people just a little bit, others intense. It goes to that panic mode. Um, so yeah, it's it's, it's quite interesting. The ones you read out now, Devin, those are the common ones. Okay. All those ones you read about, they're not you know they they're not extreme ends weird ones. They're the common ones. And if you just understand the logic if your body is again like the car that you're over revving yeah if you over rev the car all sorts of other like you hear strange noises you hear loose things going on same thing happens in your body so the muscle stuff so if you're over revving things have to start going wrong inside your body it's normal uh eye twitching is very common and it's irritating because a you can't stop it and sometimes you're talking to somebody and you see this thing going, kudu, kudu, kudu. <laughs> and then the person says, dude, what's wrong with your eye? You know, and, uh, but yeah, so, so all of that stuff, everything you read out, those are the normal common symptoms. They're, they're, uh, none of those are like extreme, extreme symptoms. Wow. wow. They're normal, absolutely normal. So your anxiety can cause all of that. But as you can see, because they're physical symptoms, we have to get them checked out. Yeah. Okay, for some kind of medical condition first, uh, because there are other many diseases that can cause those kinds of symptoms. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. first stop would be the hospital, the GP, ER, for them to check you out and tell you, listen, we checked you out, there's nothing, there's no tumor, there's no heart attack, there's no, no cancer, right? It's purely psychological. Then you're okay, then you know, okay, fine, I'm done. What we don't want is the other way around, 
where we like immediately assume that it's psychological anxiety, and then we don't actually go and check out if we are having a heart attack, if we are getting a stroke, if we are getting some other physical illness, uh, that we do have hyperthyroidism or we do have some hormonal thing. And then we try to treat it psychologically. Of course, it doesn't get better because it's not psychological. So always that line first, is it physical? You may go check that out just for people watching the show. Don't immediately make this headaches. Don't immediately assume that these are stress headaches. As a professional, you look at it, hey, is this, um, you know, is it psychological or is it um, an illness? Is it, you know, you obviously do that assumption or not assumption, yeah, but... So we, we start out the assumption that let's first get it checked out physically. So if somebody comes with it, I'll say, okay, go to your GP. Well, I'll chat the GP. I'll say, listen, I'm sending this all over. Check it out for me. Do the tests. So, so often people come via ER, and then we take that as a given that they've been checked out. People say, no, no, I, I've been to ER three times now, and they all tell me the same thing each time, and now I think I have to, it's just psychological. Okay, so then we know. So, so once you've been screened medically, we can take it as a, uh, as a safe thing that you've been screened. Mm. Um, you've been screened for illness, okay? But, that your blood has been tested, that there's nothing hormonal going on. Then we say, right, it's psychological, let's fix that. If headaches, we can't make the assumption because it could be a tumor, could be all kinds of things going on. So that must first get checked out medically. So any physical symptom that is you're having, the first, first check is, okay, the GP, the hospital, the clinic. Right? They do the test and they say, listen, absolutely not. Everything's clear, you, okay? your heart's great. It's psychological. And then the psychologist step in and fix it. And if necessary, the, uh, the, the psychiatrist will step in to help with like, the right medication for the right, the right condition. And, and then you can work. But to immediately assume that it's anxiety, that's the wrong place to start. True, true. I if we get that wrong, the person's disease gets worse and worse. And we wonder why they're not getting better. And they mean... Meantime, they've got some, some, some like a kidney issue, a liver issue, like mm. a blood issue. And then that could have been picked up earlier and fixed. Yeah. Like Certainly. hyperthyroidism, you know, you, like you really look like an anxious person. And the moment you do the test and you find that in a few days, the medication drops that and books the anxiety is gone because it was never psychological anxiety in the first place. Mm. Hey. Doc, we come to the end of our uh, episode, Signs and Symptoms yeah. of Anxiety. Is there anything that you want to add before we say no, goodbye? But, like just the... again to say that, that shows like this make a big difference to people. Because A, we, you know, like we distinct. I think you've done an amazing job because you know, you're an influential person. The fact that you came out and spoke about it openly means that other people feel, oh, okay, then there's nothing to be ashamed about. Mm. Also, some people just don't realize that there's help. Mm. You know, you like you think that's it, you're stuck for life with this kind of thing, and then you just live with it. But in fact, that, that's no longer needed. Then, you know, there's help available. So they did the, they did, um, uh, I think you, you've helped to, to demystify it, number one, and destigmatize it. Demystifying, meaning like take it out from being this mysterious thing that nobody talks about and destigmatize it that you've made it normal to say, listen, anybody can get this. There's no shame involved. Because people often think that I'm weak. And that's the unfortunate thing. People think I'm weak. And often you know, loved ones will say to you, hey man, pull yourself together, you know, just snap out of it. Then I often say, listen, if the person's leg was broken and they were in a wheelchair, do you tell them to snap out of it and get up and walk? I've never seen that happen. Have you? No, not yet. Right? Or the guy's armed in a sling, he broke it in rugby or soccer, and then you say, listen, dude, throw that sling away, man. Let's move that arm around. Nobody mm -hmm. does that. Okay, so we'll give uh, that due respect to something if it's physical, but then we disrespect it if it's psychological, and we tell people they're weak. Yeah. And then, then people start to believe that. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's me. I was wondering, I can't stop this. You know, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. 
I was one of those people years ago. I remember, you know, um, no, when somebody said anxiety, I said, it's all in your mind. You need to be strong enough to control your mind. And uh, uh, I was I was that person. And until I experienced anxiety, until I had to understand what it is, um, only then could my understanding change. And um, I think people that don't understand anxiety, uh, they it's because of maybe not being educated on it. And it's like you said, platforms like this and many others, there's people that's doing this for years. Uh, Rafik. I mean, like yourself, you, you, one of those people that's been doing in this field for years and um, that's, that's experienced or educated themselves will understand that it's, it's, it's exactly like a broken arm. And I think hopefully we get to a place one day where, we can treat it just like that. Hey, I got anxiety. I'm going for therapy. It's sorted out. It's good. I'm going to be on the mend. You know, hopefully we get that. We get to a place where we can say, ah, oh, it's just a broken arm. I just got anxiety. It's uh, it's over. It's done. I'm going to go. I'm going to go for, for for therapy, and it's gone. It's going to be gone. Um, so yeah, totally, totally understand and what I, you're you know, saying. I, and I I know what the panic attack feels like. I had my first one in '94 at Virgin Active Gym. In Seapoint, I still remember how I felt I'm going to die right there in my little shorts in the gym. So I went to just lay down and just, I, was, I thought, that's it, I'm dying right here. So, I, you know, I, I've understood that and I've, I've made an understanding of, okay, so that's how it felt. And I mm. remember just everything went dark and I, I can't describe how awful the feeling was. Mm. And then I just thought I'm going to die. And, and then I kind of slowly got out of it and, and realized it was a panic attack. But luckily, I had knowledge. Mm. So and one of my buddies is a medical doctor, right? And he could actually tell that he's starting to have a stroke because he has knowledge. Like I say, I said to people, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a stroke. Rush me to a hospital quickly. Uh, you know, so, so I suppose it helps to have some insider knowledge. But when I had the panic attack, there was no... No way for me to think it's a panic attack when it was happening. I just thought that's it. It's a heart attack. I'm going to die right here in this little tiny shorts. And small, small shorts were fashionable those days, 94, you know, even the soccer players. Anyway, the point is, I just thought that's it. I'm going to die right here. And, and then the feeling partner realized, ah, this is, this is a panic attack. Okay, you overexerted yourself and you triggered a panic attack. Now it's all it is. Just breathe, pop down, it will come right. And then it did. Okay, but I think, cool. Thank you so much for, for being part right. of the episode. Again, sharing so much information. If you're watching this and you have any questions, we will be doing a QA at the end of the, 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 the series. Ask your questions, slide in my DMs, ask me if you want to put it in the comment section of this video. Ask, we will definitely get it to Rafik and he can share some light and, and, and inform you and I on, on the things that bother you. Um, also coming up, I'm quite excited about this, the next topic, uh, Rafik, uh, it's the types of um, treatment and therapy. Um, I'm an advocate for BWRT and I'm really excited for the next episode uh, to, to, to just share with the, share with the people what is BWRT and many other forms of uh, treatment and therapy. So I'm really excited to be part of it. Again, thank you. Um, can you share your handle? Do you remember your handle from social media? How can people mm -hmm. get in touch with you? No, I'll WhatsApp it to you. I'm sorry, man. I don't remember it. I'm going to put it on the screen. I think it's Rafik Lockett, clinical psychologist on Facebook. Um, That's the one. That's the one. I will, I will, I'll put it on the screen as well as in the links. If you want to message him, ask him, if you want to get in touch with the psychologist, his number, everything will be there. Um, and yeah, this is mental awareness. We're making mental awareness. We just bring it to the people, to let them know that it's okay not to be okay. And that there is help. Rafik, thank you. It's been an honor having you and on the show. Okay. Honored to be on the show, Dave. Cheers, man. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.